The Ford Pinto case. Businessmen often complain that their profits are negatively affected by government regulations. On the other hand, history has proven that it is necessary to regulate business in at least one area. Public safety. There is ample evidence that consideration for the safety of the public is not always a priority in business decisions. Back in 1912, the Titanic smashed into an iceberg, killing hundreds of people. It was going too fast through a large collection of icebergs while attempting to set a speed record. Unfortunately, there were not enough lifeboats to accommodate the passengers. Usually, when such a tragedy occurs, the company is not found guilty. Instead, safety regulations are enacted for future cases. In the future, ships were ordered to carry a sufficient supply of lifeboats. In 1978, the Ford Motor Company was indicted on the charge of homicide. This was the first time such a charge had been brought against an American corporation. It related to the deaths of three teenage girls who were burned up when their Ford Pinto was hit from behind. The prosecution charged that the Ford Company knowingly manufactured a dangerous car. Behind this story is the pressure on Ford to produce a small car to compete with imported vehicles. The Pinto was rushed into production in spite of warnings that the gas tank was in a dangerous position. It would have cost Ford an additional eleven dollars per car to fix the problem. Ford decided not to. Later, Ford produced a cost-benefit analysis to justify their position, estimating that the faulty design would cause 180 additional deaths. Ford valued these at $200,000 per person. This cost was far less than equipping 12.5 million vehicles with $11 protectors. So Ford felt that they had made the right decision. Ford executives were acquitted on the charge of homicide. Nonetheless, Ford had to pay out millions of dollars in out-of-court settlements. These were paid to families who had lost relatives in Pinto accidents. This case shows how far a company will go to protect its profits. For more than eight years, Ford lobbied the government not to tighten safety standards on cars. As long as the Pinto was profitable, Ford did not want to change the design. Although Ford made a lot of money on the Pinto, their reputation was tarnished. The Ford Pinto case is one of many which point to the need for governments to set safety standards. No business wants to recall its products or leave them sitting idly in a warehouse or expend large sums of money for upgrading and repairs. No airplane company wants to have its planes in the hangar when they could be in the air making money for the corporation. As a result, commercial companies are seldom motivated to look closely at product or service safety. This is especially true today, when the bottom line in business is seen as a justification for every decision. For this reason, governments have to oversee issues of public safety. Most businesses are too busy working on profits to have much time or concern for doing so. The Golden Man, El Dorado. When Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain in 1492, he was trying to reach the Spice Islands, which today are called Indonesia. Spices were very scarce and valuable in Europe at this time. No one knew that two vast oceans and the American continents lay between Europe and Asia. Columbus did not find spices in America, but he did bring home some gold trinkets. The American Indians wore these as jewelry. Gold, not spices, was to become the biggest motive for exploration. Expeditions into the interior of the Americas were very costly and very risky. Only by promising the authorities huge profits could sailors and soldiers raise money for their expeditions. They also needed to promise rich rewards in order to get followers and crews. If a leader returned to Europe without gold and jewels, he might end up in jail. No wonder the Spanish conquerors were always searching for gold. At first, the Spaniards stayed around the coasts of the Caribbean Sea, but stories of gold in the interior tempted them to explore inland. They asked the Indians where their gold jewelry came from. The Indians would point further inland. They said that a wealthy people lived in the high mountains that traded gold and emeralds for pearls, cotton, and shells. 
The Spanish emperor had given the rights to exploit present-day Venezuela and Colombia to his German bankers in 1528. So Germans Dalfinger, Featherman, and Hohermuth led a series of expeditions into the jungles, grasslands, and mountains. Meanwhile, Spanish conquerors had found immense riches in gold and silver. Hernando Cortez had captured the kingdom of the Aztecs in Mexico in 1519. He had sent immense treasures to Europe. Soon after this, Francisco Pizarro began to explore the west coast of South America. In 1531, Pizarro invaded Peru and destroyed the kingdom of the Incas. Pizarro melted down the gold and silver treasures of the Incas and sent gold and silver bricks back to Spain. The rush to find more gold became very heated. Rumors came down from the mountains of Colombia about a golden man, El Hombre Dorado. There were stories about a king so rich that he wore gold dust instead of a coat. Colombia was the kingdom of the Chipchas. They were a trading people who traded salt and emeralds for gold, cotton, pearls, and shells. The actual gold did not come from their kingdom. It was found in the mountain rivers and brought to the Chipchas for refining and metalwork. Several armies converged on Chipcha territory. The first to arrive was the Spaniard Quesada, coming up the Magdalena River from the Caribbean. He found the chief cities of the Chipchas and seized their gold and emeralds. Shortly afterwards, one of Pizarro's captains arrived from Peru and Ecuador. Then the German Federman arrived from Venezuela. Quesada gave the latecomers some gold and jewels to ease their disappointment. Casada's men also found out about the Golden Man. High in the mountains was a lake created by a meteorite. The Indians believed that the Golden God from the sky now lived at the bottom of the lake. When a new leader of the tribe was elected, he was covered in grease, and fine gold dust was blown over his body so that he appeared to be made of gold. He was taken out to the middle of the lake on a raft. He would jump into the lake and stay in the water till the gold dust was washed off. It was considered an offering to the god. Gold ornaments were also tossed in the lake. Then the king and his followers would return to the shore. The ceremony was stopped several generations before the Europeans arrived. Many people were unwilling to believe that this was the whole story. They began to search for a golden city hidden in the jungle. Many explorers perished in this search. In their search for gold, the Spanish conquerors destroyed the great Indian civilizations of America. Towns and villages had been ruined. Thousands of people killed, and wonderful pieces of art melted down. Some Indians believed that gold must be a food that Europeans desperately needed to stay alive. In many cases, the Europeans destroyed the trading and social systems that had produced their wealth. When we think about the great achievements of a few conquerors and explorers, we are also sad about how much death and damage they caused. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is one of the most spectacular sights in nature. It is found in one section of the valley of the Colorado River. The river begins its course high in the Rocky Mountains of the state of Colorado. The river travels a total of 1,400 miles through Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, and into the Gulf of California. It forms part of Arizona's border with Nevada and California. The Colorado River is a very swift and muddy river. It carries dirt and rocks down from the mountains. The story is told of an old fur trader who was attacked by Indians high up the river. His only escape was down the Colorado River in a small boat. It was a terrifying trip through rapids and around rocks at top speed. The fur trader was found some days later in very rough shape, hundreds of miles down the river. No one would believe that he had come so far so fast. The Grand Canyon stretches for about 250 miles in the state of Arizona. The canyon was carved out by the flow of the river itself. In places, the canyon is more than a mile deep. It stretches from four to 18 miles wide at the top. The canyon valley contains worn rocks that rise up like a mountain range. The canyon has been worn down through many layers of rock. The river has cut its way down through layers of sandstone, limestone, and shaped to the ground. 
granite bedrock. The different layers are of different colors, and the rocks appear very beautiful, especially at sunrise and sunset. Because the canyon is so deep, the climate changes as you go down into the valley. At the top, the climate is typical of a mountain area with evergreen trees. Next, you have typical forest trees. Third, there are plants like cacti that grow in warm deserts. Finally, there are subtropical plants at the valley bottom. Tourists can ride down the narrow trails to the bottom of the valley on mules. On one side is the rock wall of the canyon, and on the other side is a steep drop down to the bottom. Tourists have to trust their guide and the mule that they are riding to get them down safely. The trails zigzag back and forth, and the tourist going down travels much more than a mile. Some 1,000 square miles of the area became the Grand Canyon National Park in 1919. Because the Colorado River is very swift and runs through dry country, several dams have been built along it. These are designed to harness its power, save its water, and provide recreational opportunities. The best known dam is Hoover Dam, formerly Boulder Dam, on the Arizona-Nevada border. This impressive structure is 727 feet high and 1,282 feet long. Elevators are used to carry workers up and down inside the dam. The water, which is backed up by the Hoover Dam, forms Lake Mead. Lake Mead is used to irrigate nearby land as well as for boating and fishing. The dam itself is a major source of electric power for this section of the country. Visitors to the Grand Canyon are often filled with awe by the size and beauty of the canyon. People seem very small in comparison to the immense cliffs, valleys, and the mighty river. The Niagara Parks Commission. Niagara Falls, Canada, became a major tourist attraction in the mid 1830s. By this time, roads, canals, and railways were able to bring people from urban centers like New York and Boston. However, the chance for big profits attracted dishonest businessmen. One hotel in the 1860s was popularly known as the Cave of the Forty Thieves. There were many complaints from tourists about tricks that were used to get their money. Some businessmen tried to put up fences around the falls so that all visitors would have to pay them to see the falls. In time, these complaints reached the ears of important people. In 1873, Lord Dufferin, the Governor General of Canada, proposed that the government buy all the land around the falls. On the American side, New York State bought 412 acres around the American Rainbow Falls in 1885. In the same year, land was bought near the Canadian Horseshoe Falls and named Queen Victoria Park. A commission was formed to obtain control of all land along the Niagara River. This was made easier because a narrow strip along the river was already government land. However, the commission wanted to preserve all the beautiful scenery along the river and near the falls for the general public. The first commissioner of the park was Sir Kazimierz Gzowski, a distinguished engineer of Polish birth. Before the Queen Victoria Park Commission began to buy up land besides the falls, tourists had to pay for everything. There were no public washrooms, no drinking fountains, and no safety barriers around the falls. As a result, it was not uncommon for tourists crowding close to the falls or hypnotized by the flow of the river to step too close and fall in. The commission took care of these problems and also set up parks and picnic areas. In 1927, the commission's name was changed to the Niagara Parks Commission. It now supervises numerous attractions and parks from Niagara on the Lake on Lake Ontario down to Fort Erie on Lake Erie. Each section of the 56-kilometer stretch of Niagara Parks has its own places of interest. These are joined by the Niagara Parkway, a road that runs the whole length of the river. Sir Winston Churchill called the Parkway the prettiest Sunday afternoon drive in the world. The Niagara Parks Commission operates restaurants, parks and gardens, rides, museums, and historic houses, golf courses, native sites, and gift shops. Near the falls are restaurants, parks, greenhouses, the journey behind the falls, and the Maid of the Mist boat ride. North of the falls at Niagara Gorge are the Spanish Arrow car ride and the Great Gorge Adventure. The commission also operates a school of horticulture with large gardens.
Queenston Heights is a park commemorating one of Canada's heroes, General Isaac Brock. In nearby Queenston are historic houses connected with two other important Canadians, Laura Secord and William Lyne Mackenzie. The commission also operates two historic forts dating from the War of 1812, Fort George and Old Fort Erie. The Niagara Parks Commission has played a major role in making Niagara Falls and the Niagara River one of the leading tourist areas in the world. The commission shows how governments can work to make visits to natural wonders like Niagara Falls a good experience for the general public. The Welland Canal. Before railways and automobiles became common, transporting goods over long distances was a difficult chore. In early North America, roads were often bad or non-existent. In the winter, snow and cold weather made travel difficult. Frontier farmers had trouble selling their crops because it was hard to get them to the cities. Often, rivers and lakes were the best ways to travel. Fur traders carried their furs and other supplies in canoes, but even large canoes were not big enough to hold a shipment of wheat. Rapids and waterfalls meant that goods had to be taken out of the canoe and carried to the next body of calm water. One way to improve water transportation was to build a canal. In New York State, Governor DeWitt Clinton had constructed the Erie Canal from the Niagara River to the Hudson River soon after the War of 1812. Because relations between the United States and Canada were still not very friendly, this was another reason to build a canal on the Canadian side. Canals could be used to move supplies and troops during wartime. Sometimes the British government would forbid Canadian farmers to sell food to the USA. Without a canal to move their farm produce, crops were sometimes left to rot. A Saint Catharines, Ontario merchant named William Hamilton Merritt thought about all these things in the 1820s. He also thought that flour mills needed a more reliable source of water to operate. Saint Catharines is on 12 Mile Creek below the Niagara Escarpment. This creek runs towards Lake Ontario. It rises above the escarpment, which stands from 150 to 300 feet high, then runs towards Lake Ontario. If Merritt could join the 12 Mile Creek to one of the rivers, which ran to Lake Erie, the canal would provide transportation and water power. The problem was to find a way to move boats up the escarpment. From 1824 to 1829, Merritt and his friends hired laborers to dig away tons of dirt and rock. Nearly all the work was done with shovels, pickaxes, horses, and wagons. In places, the ground was soft and landslides occurred. In other places, the men had to dig through solid granite rock. Merritt's main problem, however, was raising the money to pay for the construction. After sinking all the money that he, his family, and friends had into the canal, more was needed. Merritt went to Toronto, New York, and finally London, England, to get the financial support he needed. The problem of getting the boats to climb the escarpment was solved by a series of 35 wooden locks. These carried a ship 327 feet upwards. The ship would enter a lock with a small amount of water. More water would come into the lock, lifting the boat another 10 or 15 feet. Then the ship would move into the next lock and be lifted up again. Boats going in the opposite direction were lowered instead of lifted. The Welland Canal has been rebuilt three times since the first canal opened in 1829. Now, large seagoing and lake vessels cross the Niagara Peninsula from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. They carry grain, coal, iron ore. Oil and many other bulk products. The Welland Canal remains one of the most important commercial waterways in the world. Walmart stores. Walmart is now the world's largest retail organization. Walmart employs around 1.2 million people worldwide. In 2000, Walmart had sales of more than 191 billion dollars, with profits of 6.3 billion dollars. Profits increased 16 percent from the previous year. 
people have come to expect that Walmart's profits will increase substantially every year. Each year, more stores are opened and Walmart expands into new countries. Walmart also enters new areas of business nearly every year. Few people know that Walmart is also a major real estate company. Sam Walton opened his Walton's Five and Dime in Bentonville, Arkansas, in 1950. Twelve years later, he opened the first Walmart in Bentonville. His business philosophy was simple: good prices, great selection, and a friendly greeting. Walton was known for the ten-foot attitude. This means that any employee should greet any customer who is within ten feet of them. He emphasized that it is important to speak to people before they speak to you. Walton also believed that good deals from suppliers should be passed along to customers. The combination of low prices and friendly service is basic to Walmart's success. That one store in Bentonville has become 4,203 stores in the USA, plus another 1,000 outside the United States. Walton died in 1992, but his business philosophy continues to be preached at Walmart's. Each store has greeters who meet the customers at the door and deal with any special needs they have. Having greeters gives the effect of having more service clerks than Walmart really has. Compared to some other department stores, Walmart has relatively fewer employees. Walmart also has the Walmart Foundation, which sponsors numerous good causes. Among their programs are high school scholarships, fundraising for local hospitals and sick children, environmental concerns, and community matching grant outreach. So, what's not to like about Walmart? The main complaint is that their business style is extremely aggressive. Walmart's attitudes towards manufacturers and suppliers are: "You do it our way, or we won't do business with you." This puts Walmart at an advantage over smaller retails who don't have the same retailing power. Walmart has been known to demand that its suppliers provide products at discount for Walmart store openings, levy fines for shipment errors, tell manufacturers what products, styles, and colors to make, etc. Walmart expects product delivery in two days and expects manufacturers to cooperate with its promotional and retailing strategies. In effect, any company that works with Walmart becomes one of their employees. Any company which so dominates one area of the market will have a lot of power. So far, Walmart has been successful in getting what it wants and providing customers with what they want. Yellowstone National Park. The Rocky Mountains of North America are quite old. Even though they were very volcanic millions of years ago, only a couple were still active today. In Yellowstone National Park, however, there is a large area of land which indicates recent volcanic activity. This area contains hot springs, geysers, and mud springs. Hot springs like geysers are caused by underground water being heated by hot rocks down in the earth. This hot water is then forced to the surface. When the surface rock is soft or porous, then the hot water bubbles up like a spring. When the surface rock is hard, then the hot water shoots up through any hole in the rock that it can find. These spurts of hot water are called geysers. Yellowstone also contains mud pots or mud springs. These happen when the hot water is turned to steam, and the steam carries mud and clay to the surface. Yellowstone Park is high up in the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming. Very few white people went there until the 1860s. It is said that Indians avoided the area because they thought that evil spirits lived there. In 1869, three men from Montana decided to explore this remote area. They were very impressed with its natural wonders and talked about it to others. Two other exploring expeditions followed in the next two years. These visitors were so enthusiastic about the beauty and majesty of Yellowstone that they asked that it be made a national park. At that time, there was no national park system in America. Nonetheless, in 1872, the American government agreed to set aside these lands as a public park. Why were the early visitors to Yellowstone so impressed? 
First, the scenery is spectacular. The Yellowstone River has created its own Grand Canyon through years of eroding its rocky banks. It is the yellow color of these canyon walls that gave Yellowstone its name. The area has many waterfalls, including the 308-foot-high Lower Falls in the Yellowstone River. There are many beautiful lakes, and the largest is Yellowstone Lake. The area is rich in wildlife. Among the mammals are black bears, grizzly bears, elk, moose, mule deer, bison, bighorn sheep, coyotes, pronghorn antelope, beaver, and wolves. Birds, especially waterfowl, are common all year. These include the trumpeter swan, blue heron, cormorants, bald eagles, osprey, pelicans, Canada geese, and many kinds of ducks. Sport fish are also plentiful. About 80 percent of the forest consists of lodgepole pine, but there are many other evergreens. Wildflowers are numerous and varied, but the chief attractions are the geysers and hot springs. They occur in what was a very volcanic area a million years or so ago. Here, hot molten lava from the center of the Earth has remained close to the surface of the Earth. This lava heats the surface rocks, which in turn heats the underground water. The heated water shoots up to the surface as geysers or bubbles up as hot springs. The most famous geyser is Old Faithful, which shoots its plume of water 150 feet into the air every 65 minutes or so. The eruption lasts up to five minutes. There are 200 geysers in Yellowstone Park, and about 50 of them are spectacular. Some shoot their spray over 200 feet high. Visitors from all over the world are delighted that this region has been preserved as a national park. Student newspapers. In North America, most colleges and universities, as well as many high schools, have a student newspaper. These newspapers focus on happenings at the school. They inform the student population about activities on campus and often include world news, which is relevant to student interests. In addition, there are opinion pieces by the student editors, which reflect their views on the school and the world. Sometimes these editorials oppose the way that the school is being run. Occasionally, school officials will try to shut down or censor student papers if they find their writing embarrassing or offensive. But usually, these disagreements are resolved by discussion. At some colleges, the student newspaper is connected to a professional program in journalism. But most of the time, the idea behind the paper is to get students to research the facts, debate the issues, and learn how to get their opinions expressed. If these students go on to become professional journalists, that is fine, but it is not really expected. You might wonder whether enough things happen at a college to fill out a weekly paper. Yes, indeed, schools and universities reflect the real world. There are often problems with the budget and cuts to programs. New buildings go up or are torn down. Policies change. Tuition goes up. Classrooms become crowded, and personnel come and go. University morale and funding often reflect government policies and social attitudes. These tie the college to the larger world. Editorials often comment on how national and world events affect the university. At the same time, there are many things going on within the university. Construction disturbs classes. Offices are broken into. Computers are stolen. Accidents happen in the parking lot. Students die on the roads during the holidays. Sports teams win or lose. Graduation takes place. Students and instructors win awards. Plays are put on. Distinguished visitors speak. Rock bands are in concert. Then there is always the question of student rights and responsibilities. What kinds of student behavior are unacceptable? Should the university pay attention to student activities off campus? Committees meet with student representation to set guidelines for these matters. Another issue is who sets the agenda for the university. Corporate sponsors today are buying exclusive rights to distribute their products on campus. Governments are expecting universities to follow official policies in order to receive funding. Social groups are demanding that university policies reflect their special interests. 
So there is no shortage of topics for student journalists to address. Of course, they also write about everything that young people are interested in: music, movies, computers, sports, travel, and pop culture. Student newspapers are an important training group for democracy. They are also very interesting to read. Canadian colleges and universities. Canada has about 50 accredited universities spread across 10 provinces. All except one are primarily government-funded. This means that there is considerable uniformity regarding programs, administration, and policy. Private colleges tend to be smaller and are mostly based on a religious curriculum. Most universities offer programs in the humanities, social sciences, and pure sciences. Many have additional faculties such as education and physical education. Many programs that lead directly to a position in the workplace are given at community colleges. Community colleges differ from universities because their programs involve job training and practical experience. For example, they might offer courses in areas such as computer programming, journalism, photography, social work, dentistry, and nursing. Their programs are considered to be less abstract and academic than university programs. Many students see university as being more fun than community college. They don't have to worry immediately about getting a job, and the social life is often better at university. However, a university degree may be less likely to lead directly to a job. Nowadays, university programs which are work-related, such as business administration, education, child studies, and psychology, seem especially popular. Universities, however, were founded mainly as liberal arts institutions. This means that their original intent was to prepare people to be well-rounded human beings and knowledgeable citizens. So, nearly all universities have programs in literature, languages, philosophy, culture, music. History and politics, as well as studies that are more job-related, a past BA or BSc degree in Canada is normally three full years of study after secondary school. A bachelor degree with honors includes one more year of study. A master's degree is a further one or two years. A doctorate usually requires four or more years. This is similar to the United States, except that their bachelor degree is normally three years, and their master's degree may be up to three years. To gain entrance to university, you usually need to graduate from secondary school with a B average. Some programs will require an A average. Tuition costs have gone up in recent years as governments have handed over less money to colleges and universities. More students now have to work during the school year to pay their expenses. Attending college and university is known to be one of the most carefree periods in a person's life. As long as you keep up with your readings and assignments, you should be able to avoid major difficulties. Facilities for athletics, student radio and newspapers, pubs and lounges, and generally pleasant surroundings make campus life agreeable. It is a good time to make friends, learn new skills, and take calculated risks. Moreover, colleges and universities are a good practical investment as they help to prepare young people for a changing world. Coffee and donuts. Let's go for coffee. All over North America, friends like to meet at the coffee shop. Here, people sit and talk about the day's business, news, and sports. Personal concerns, shop talk, or simply gossip. Coffee shops have an informal atmosphere that encourages conversation. You don't have to dress up either. Students drop in wearing T-shirts and blue jeans and sit beside businessmen wearing suits and ties. Many coffee shops are open 24 hours a day, including Sundays and holidays. That way, people who work at night or who have trouble sleeping can drop in at any time. Because coffee and donuts are relatively inexpensive, people feel comfortable sitting for a while, knowing that they are not spending a lot of money. Although coffee and donuts are the main items sold at coffee shops, many also serve other beverages and desserts, and sometimes a light lunch. 
Many patrons have a favorite kind of coffee or other drink and will drive past other coffee shops to go to one that serves the flavor they like. Visitors from other countries are often surprised at how roomy these coffee shops can be. Some are as large as regular restaurants. Having a nice bit of space around them encourages people to relax. Some people arrange regular dates and meet every day or every week at the same time. For example, retired friends may get together every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Others stop every morning at the drive in line to get their coffee for work. Even people who have coffee machines at home or at work like to go to coffee shops to get a special kind of coffee or a favorite treat. It might seem that the business owners would not make much money just selling a few items, but in fact, many coffee shops do extremely well, especially if they are located in a busy traffic area. Then business tends to be steady all through the day. Not only do people come in and sit down, but there is usually a lot of takeout business as well. People go to coffee shops not only to socialize with family and friends, but also to discuss business or treat their employees to a snack. Others go there to read the newspaper or a favorite magazine. Some people even go there to do work. This article was written in a coffee shop. Of course, people who come here usually like coffee and donuts. Coffee is the favorite hot drink in North America, but most shops also serve tea, hot chocolate, and cappuccino, as well as some other cold beverages. Donuts are usually round and are small deep fried breads with various toppings. Most donuts have a hole in the middle. Even these holes, which are punched out of the donut, can be sold separately as a kind of mini donut. Everywhere you go in North America, you will see coffee shops. So take half an hour to stop in and relax. You'll enjoy the great North American coffee break. Medical Missionary During the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, British people traveled around the whole world. They charted the seas, mapped out distant countries, and studied plants, animals, and people. They also claimed many lands for England. This kind of international travel was made easier by improved transportation and communication. New inventions such as steamships, trains, telegraphs, and telephones made long distances seem smaller. Of course, people had different reasons for going to distant lands. Some were businessmen who saw economic opportunities overseas. Soldiers wanted fame and a chance to enlarge the British Empire. Big game hunters wanted to be the first to shoot strange animals and bring back trophies to England. Scientists intended to study unknown animals and plants. Missionaries planned to be the first to introduce Christianity to faraway people. In 1836, a young Scotsman called David Livingston began to study medicine in Glasgow. Livingston intended to become a medical missionary. This means that he would be a doctor, as well as a preacher and teacher. Livingston, 1813 to 1873, came from a poor family. From an early age, he had worked 14 hours a day in a clothing factory for very little pay. But he was determined to learn. He took his books with him to the factory and read as he worked. Then, after work, he would go to his teacher to learn more. Livingston's goal was to teach faraway people about Jesus. However, unlike some missionaries, he was also interested in science, geography, and exploring. He had planned to go to China in 1839, but because of the Opium Wars, no missionaries were being sent there. Instead, he asked to go to South Africa. Europeans had traveled around the coasts of Africa for hundreds of years, but very few white people had traveled inland. A missionary named Robert Moffat, who had begun a mission at Curiman in the interior, inspired Livingston. Livingston arrived in Curiman in 1841. This was the farthest outpost of white settlement, and no one seemed to want to go further inland. Livingston felt that the missionaries should go to the Africans, rather than waiting for the Africans to come to them. With a fellow missionary, he set out. When they came to an African tribe, 
they would talk to the chief and ask permission to preach to his people. Livingston would also set up a tent and treat the people who had diseases. After a while, he would move on to the next tribe. Once Livingston learned the Bantu language, he would talk to many Africans. But sometimes he needed interpreters. There were many diseases, including malaria and sleeping sickness. Livingston suffered much of his life from river fever. He was also so weak that he rode on the back of an ox. Livingston wanted to stop the slave trade. At this time, the slave trade was the most profitable business in Africa. Livingston hoped that if other kinds of trade were developed, then slavery could be abolished. In order to open up trade, he wanted to find an easy route into the center of Africa. Livingston kept going further into the interior. He was probably the first European to cross the Kalahari Desert before reaching Lake Nagami in present-day Botswana. Not long after, he traveled further inland. He explored the sources of the Zambezi and Kansai rivers, and eventually reached the west coast of Africa and Luanda, Angola. Livingston was being criticized for neglecting missionary work in order to explore. Livingston replied that he was opening up the continent for missionaries. Meanwhile, he was becoming famous as a great explorer. The British government commissioned him to explore the Zambezi River. They hoped that ships could sail up the river into the interior. Unfortunately, the Zambezi had too many rapids. However, Livingston did find a route up the Shire River to Lake Nyasa. He continued to struggle against the slave trade, which is now being taken over by Arabs. Livingston died in Africa in 1873. He was the first white man to explore Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and surrounding areas. He was not only a great explorer, but also a fine doctor and a good missionary. Nowadays, the countries that Livingston visited are nearly all Christian. Just as he had hoped they would be. Favorite cookies. North Americans are known for their sweet tooth. This means that they like snacks with lots of sugar. Americans drink a lot of coffee, tea, and hot chocolate, and usually they have something sweet with their drink. Cookies are one of America's favorite desserts. The word cookie comes from a Dutch word meaning little cake. People from Europe brought their favorite recipes with them when they came to America. The English brought their custom of having tea in the afternoon. Usually, with their tea, they would have cakes or biscuits. Biscuits are usually hard wafers, like, for example, ginger snaps. In fact, the Italian slang word for Englishman is cake eater. In the early days, all cookies were homemade. But in the late 19th century, biscuits began to be manufactured in large quantities by machine. In 1912, the National Biscuit Company (Nabisco) in the USA introduced Oreo cookies. This cookie has a rich cream vanilla filling between two crispy chocolate wafers. This product was designed to meet the demand for an English-style biscuit. Oreos were good to dunk in a drink, to eat whole. To eat in parts or to use in cooking, Oreos have become both America's and the world's favorite commercial cookie. New varieties of Oreos are added regularly to the original product. Although commercial biscuits like Oreos are very popular, many people prefer home baked ones. In fact, there is a whole line of commercial cookies called Home Style, which try to imitate homemade cookies. The most popular cookie in America can be either bought in a package or baked at home. These are chocolate chip cookies. Ruth and Kenneth Wakefield operated the Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts. One day in 1930, Mrs. Wakefield ran out of baking chocolate for her baking cookies. She broke up a chocolate bar and added the pieces to her cookie mix. She expected that the chocolate bits would melt into the dough when she baked them, but they didn't. Soon, chocolate chip cookies were being made commercially by adding small chunks of chocolate to regular chocolate cookie dough. 
Lots of people like to make their own by adding commercial chocolate chips to their dough. Now, chocolate chip cookies are the most popular kind of cookie in North America. Over seven billion are eaten annually here. Half of all the cookies baked in American homes are chocolate chip cookies. Experiments in baking and packaging have led to new kinds of cookies. Recently, soft cookies have become very popular. Since they are packaged in foil, they can stay fresh and soft for many months. It seems likely that the love of cookies will be around for a long time. Florence Nightingale. It could be said that Florence Nightingale was responsible for inventing modern nursing. Indeed, Nightingale did open up the professions to women generally. Her example and influence during the mid to late 19th century were an important factor in opening doors to women. Nightingale's own life reflects many of these changes. She was born in 1820 and was one of two daughters of a wealthy English family. Her mother was a beautiful society lady who had once turned down a favored suitor because he was not wealthy enough. She wanted both her daughters to be socially popular and to marry rich and important men. Florence's father ensured that she had a good education, but she was frustrated because girls and women were always under parental supervision. She felt called to a life of action. But her family insisted that she divide her time between being with her family and attending social functions. She was not allowed to do anything on her own. When she was sixteen, Nightingale said that God spoke to her and called her to do His work. But Florence didn't know what work she was being called to do. Years passed away while she sat with her mother and sister, or attended dances and concerts, or traveled to Europe. Nightingale became more angry and rebellious. She offended her family and friends by refusing to marry several prominent men who wanted to marry her. By the time she was twenty-four, she had decided to be a nurse. But how did one become a nurse? At that time, the profession didn't seem promising. The only respectable nurses were those women in religious orders that ministered to the patient's spiritual health, but were not trained in medicine. The majority of nurses were poor, untrained women who were suspected of being too fond of men or alcohol or both. In fact, one hospital preferred to hire unwed mothers as nurses because they had no reputations to lose. Nightingale's family was horrified by her plans. Their opposition delayed her plans, but could not stop them. In 1850, she visited a hospital in Germany for the first time. In 1853, she was appointed superintendent of a women's nursing home in London. But Florence was still waiting for her true calling. In 1855, the Times of London was printing reports from the Crimean War. France and England were fighting Russia in the Crimean Peninsula. After one Allied victory, the wounded French soldiers were well taken care of, but the wounded English soldiers were left to die. Back in England, there was a public outcry. It was Florence's opportunity. She was soon on her way to Istanbul, Turkey, with thirty-eight nurses. Scutari, Turkey, was the hospital where the British wounded were brought. This so-called hospital was a death pit, where forty-two out of every one hundred men died. The army was unwilling to listen to Miss Nightingale or to let her tend the wounded. She had to wait until conditions became so bad that the regular medical officers were overwhelmed. As soon as the army turned to her, she immediately went to work. She had the entire hospital cleaned, a new kitchen set up, and a good water supply obtained. The death rate dropped to 22 out of every 1,000. Nightingale became famous overnight. Although her efforts in the Crimean War injured her health, she continued her work back in London. She published a 1,000-page report on medical conditions in the British Army, several books on nursing, and her own proposals and suggestions. She also set up a training school for nurses.
Long before her death in 1910, she had seen nursing become a well-established profession. Almost single-handedly, she had helped to bring about proper treatment of the sick and injured. Harriet Tubman Before the American Civil War, the economy of the southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops, like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset, picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. Slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was 15, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet was knocked unconscious for many days. All the rest of her life she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the South to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations, and the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the south. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793, Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about 11 trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about 300 people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the northern states. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells the story of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. Hernias repaired here. A hernia occurs when there is a tear or weakness in the muscle layers of the abdomen. This allows the intestines to push forward into the gap. Usually the person feels some discomfort and may notice an egg-shaped swelling. In a few cases, the muscle layers may clamp down on the protruding intestine and cut off its oxygen supply. This can result in death if medical help is not readily available. Hernias are more common in men than women and are often related to lifting heavy materials. Although most hernias are not a serious threat to health, they usually get worse over time. 
The only cure is surgery to repair the cut, tear, or weakness. As with any surgery, time in a hospital is usually required for recovery. This proved to be a problem in Canada during World War II. Many young men were declared unfit for military service because they had hernias. During the war, there was a shortage of doctors and beds for hernia repair. A Toronto doctor, Dr. Edward Scholdeis, decided to address this problem. He personally operated on 70 of these young men using a technique of his own. This Scholdeis technique allowed the patients a quicker recovery time than the usual method. It also had a much lower rate of complications and failures. After the war, Dr. Scholdeis opened his own hernia clinic for the public. In 1953, a second hospital was started in Thornhill, just north of Toronto, and today all surgery is done there. The Scholdeis Hospital is located on a beautiful piece of land with a valley on one side and a golf course on the other. The large grounds have wonderful gardens and flowering trees. There are nature paths for patients to walk on. The building itself is not a regular hospital, but more like a hotel or residence where patients can play the piano, shoot pool, play shuffleboard, or practice their putting. The hospital now has 89 beds, and an average of 30 hernia operations are performed daily. Since all the surgeons are specialists, their level of skill is very high, and less than 1% of operations need to be corrected. The worldwide rate of failure is around 20%. For patients, the good news is that everything at the hospital is directed to repairing their hernia and aiding their recovery as quickly as possible. The staff encourages its patients to walk and exercise within four or five hours of surgery. Patients usually stay on for several more days until they are fully recovered and ready to go home. Scholdeis's best advertisements are his satisfied customers. Hernia patients come not only from Canada and the United States, but also from many countries of the world to receive the best possible treatment. Scholdeis remains the most famous hospital in the world, devoted entirely to the repair and treatment of hernias. Julie Andrews Julie Andrews, born Julia Elizabeth Wells, was born on October 1, 1935. She lived in a small town called Walton-on-the-Thames in England, which is south of London. Her father, Ted Wells, was a teacher, and mother, Barbara, was a pianist and piano teacher. She also played piano for her sister's dancing school. Julie learned ballet and tap as a toddler from her aunt, Joan Morris. By the time Julie was three, she could read and write. When Julie was four, her parents divorced, and Barbara married Ted Andrews, a performer during the war and an excellent tenor. He soon began giving Julie singing lessons. At seven years of age, Julie had an unbelievable range of four octaves. She soon changed her last name to Andrews, the last name of her stepfather. As she grew older, Julie became one of England's most popular performers. In early childhood, Julie loved to play with her two younger half-brothers, but soon went on to stardom. At age 12, Julie was cast in a London play and stopped the show with her remarkable talent. She starred in many different BBC productions during the 40s. Later, she starred in many Broadway plays such as The Boyfriend, My Fair Lady, and Camelot. It was the latter play that Walt Disney made a special trip to New York to see, and he decided then and there that Julie was perfect for the role of Mary Poppins in the film of the same name. Mary Poppins was the high-spirited magical nanny of Jane and Michael Banks, two small British children. Julie also starred in many other films, such as The Americanization of Emily, Hawaii, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and my personal favorite, The Sound of Music. In this production, she plays Maria, the lively governess of Austrian naval captain George von Trapp's seven children, Liesel, Frederick, Louisa, Kurt, Brigida, Marta, and Gretel. Another of Julie's talents is writing, 
Two of her best-known books are the last of their really great Wang Doodles and Mandy. Julie also has five children: a daughter, Emma Kate Walton, from her marriage to Tony Walton; four children from her second marriage to Blake Edwards, two of whom were from Blake's previous marriage, Jennifer and Jeffrey, and two who were adopted from Vietnam, Amy and Joanna. In 1998, tragedy struck Julie. She lost her extraordinary talent for singing due to surgery on her throat in order to remove a benign tumor. A year later, she made an attempt to sing again. However, her voice will never be the same. Julie has recently been on Britain's royal honor list and is now a dame. Potato chips and corn chips. The story goes that the potato chip was invented in Saratoga Springs, New York, in 1853. Multi-millionaire Cornelius Vanderbilt complained to the chef that his fried potatoes were sliced too thickly. Chef George Crum responded by slicing the potatoes paper thin and frying them in hot oil. The potato chip became an instant success. Many companies have made large profits on chips. The most successful brands are associated with the Frito Lay Company. Herman W. Lay of Nashville, Tennessee, was selling potato chips from the back of his car in the early 1930s. He soon became a successful distributor for a brand of potato chips, which were made in Atlanta, Georgia. When that company ran into financial problems, Lay arranged to buy them out. It now became H. W. Lay and Company. Meanwhile, in Texas, Elmer Doolin was trying to sell chips made from corn dough. This was an old Mexican recipe which Doolin had found in San Antonio, Texas. At first, these Fritos corn chips were made in Mr. Doolin's mother's kitchen. It took a few years before they sold very well. Mr. Doolin moved the company to Dallas and began to expand his market. In 1945, he granted the H. W. Lay Company the rights to make Fritos corn chips for the American Southeast. In 1961, the two companies merged to become Frito Lay Incorporated. In 1965, Frito Lay merged with Pepsi to become PepsiCo Incorporated, one of the largest snack food and beverage companies in the world. In 2000. Frito Lay sold 58 percent of all the snack chips in the USA. In Canada and the United States, Frito Lay products had sales of 9.9 billion dollars. The most popular brand was Lay's potato chips, followed by Doritos, Ruffles, Tostitos, Cheetos, and Fritos. Internationally, Frito Lay has 28 percent of the market worldwide. That amounts to 5.9 billion dollars annually. Why are potato chips and corn chips so popular? Well, they are versatile. You can eat them by themselves or with a sandwich for lunch. They can replace other forms of potatoes and corn. They can also come in various flavors. For example, potato chip flavors include ketchup, salt and vinegar, barbecue, dill pickle, and cheddar. Potato chips can be thick or thin, ridged or flat, spicy or bland. Chips can be made from many things besides potatoes. There is corn dough and tortilla dough, of course, but chips can also be made from sweet potatoes, parsnips, taro root, peppers, and other vegetables. One caution about potato chips is that they are not a good source of nutrition. Parents who send their children to school with a bag of potato chips for lunch need to remember that these are just a snack. Because snack chips usually contain a lot of fat, they can also lead to weight gain. It is better not to eat snack chips too often and not to eat them instead of healthier foods. In Canada, nearly two billion dollars is spent on snack foods every year, and half of this is spent on chips. People are always looking for new flavors to try. Spicy chips are gaining in popularity. The snack chip industry just keeps on growing.